The scene uh, that I want to paint for you at the outset of my sermon is a common one. Imagine two or more children sitting in a bedroom of one of the children or in a playroom, uh, and there are a variety of toys. The children, as they uh, walk around the room or as they crawl around the room, uh, look at the various toys and kind of ignore this one and that one until one of them gives all of his attention to some particular toy and then begins to play. And all of a sudden, that toy is the toy everybody in that room wants. And thus, the wrestling match begins. Who's going to get the toy? Or as I thought of examples or illustrations that might begin this sermon this evening, another picture, another scenario uh, came to my mind. A couple, recently married, as it were, living in a small house, very few belongings, beginning their life together. It's a joyful time because they're working hard together to make ends meet. They're feeling the pain of the pinch together and and rejoicing together as they seek to find frugal ways to enjoy vacations on a small income. And then one night you're invited to a friend's house. This couple gets a chance to go over to one of their friend's house. They all graduated from college at about the same time. And, and yet, as they come up the driveway to this house that this friends live in, it's obvious that they're doing far better than our first couple. And they go in and they enjoy the evening and they enjoy the, the, the music on the stereo system and they enjoy the, the house that they're in. They, they marvel at the kitchen. But among all the other things that they see in the house, there's, there's one thing that, that catches their, their mind and their attention, especially that of the husband, and it's the... Uh, Coffee espresso machine. Well, you enjoy the evening, you enjoy the, the dinner, you enjoy the espresso and the cappuccino after dinner, and, and then you go home for the night uh, enjoying the laughter. And then the next few days go by, and, and the man finds himself at Kohl's with some Kohl's cash and his 30% off coupon, and, and he's looking for that sweater or that dress shirt that is going to just meet the need that he has at work. And, and while he's walking, he happens to find himself walking through the small appliance section. And so he just, I'll just look, you know, there's, there's that uh, Cafe Espresso Supremo. And he says, wow, you know, there you are, but you know, it's, it's past the budget, going to have to pass. So he pulls himself out of the department. He's on a mission, gets his shirt, gets, on, gets home. But you know, the next morning he makes his coffee. And it's just not as hot as that espresso machine. And he goes on, and pretty soon he's, you know, has his second cup that night after dinner, and he he's, tells his wife, you know, it, it, something wrong with the coffee machine. It just doesn't taste right. Oh, no, I'm, this is the way it's always tasted. It's wonderful. I... I I don't know. I mean, it just doesn't taste right. A few days later, he's taking his coffee out. He's in a hurry, and he spills it, and he, and he's, you know, always thought this thing wasn't made quite right. Defective. And there he is at work. Up pops up Macy's ad, 25% off. Kitchen appliances. Well, Macy's is on the way home, so he heads home for the day and comes in at the end of the day and Greets his wife with words like this. Honey, I bought you a present. <laughs> now we all know what's really going on in his heart, don't we? He's gotten hooked by the Cafe Supremo espresso maker. We've studied the Ten Commandments. And in our study, we've ranged over a lot of topics. We've, we've discussed the relationship of 
our relationship to God, our relationship to men on many different levels. We've discussed the numerous different sins. We've discussed numerous areas of life, uh, priorities in life, how we ought to worship sincerity versus hypocrisy, images of our own making or worshiping God by the image that he alone has put before us and for us. God's reputation in our sincerity, work and rest, parenting and children, life and death, husbands and wives, the proper use of stuff, the proper use of the tongue. We come to the end of the Ten Commandments. And there's a sense in which all of a sudden it, it, it takes a, a kind of a right-angled turn. And we're going to talk about coveting. Isn't that a kind of a minor issue? As one man put it, he says, you've already dealt with the biggies that really capture somebody's heart. Not a very good literary practice. You've talked about the, the lust and you've talked about the murder and stealing and, and now we're going to talk about coveting? Isn't that rather anticlimactic? Isn't that rather, you know, come on. I mean, we've, we've really been dealing with some important issues here, right? Well, I hope that by the end of the sermon tonight, you'll understand more fully, and I know many of you already do, just how important this last command is. And it's not anticlimactic. In one sense, if I can put it this way, we're coming to the real heart of the matter. So let me begin by asking a question then. What is coveting? What is coveting? You shall not covet, the commandment says. Twice, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Well, the basic meaning of the word covet means to crave, to yearn for, to set your heart on something. It's a word which can be used in a positive light for, for good things, having a craving for something that is good. Uh, it's a word that, uh, if, I, if I remember looking at the verses correctly and I, I gathered this information correctly, it's a word which is actually used to describe God's activity. He has a, a desire for things, a heart for things, so certainly that's not sinful. But clearly, since something is being forbidden here, it's a sinful longing or craving for something, a sinful placing your heart upon that. And we see that as highlighted in the commandment by the fact that this coveting is coveting something that already belongs to somebody else. Coveting your neighbor's house. Coveting your neighbor's things. Like the ninth commandment, the, the tenth commandment follows on to talk about our relationship to others. It highlights this word neighbor. And it really brings to the forefront that something has to do with what happens within a community. What happens with relationship to others. And there's this coveting of what belongs to others. And clearly if it's somebody else's wife, she can't be yours. And if it's somebody else's house, it's not yours. And so whatever this setting of my heart upon it is, whatever this longing and yearning for it is, it's not right because it's not mine. We all know that with the child, right? That first illustration, how many parents have had to stop those kinds of circumstances and say, he had the toy first. She had that first. It's theirs. And that's what's being addressed here. And, and this is an important matter because this is, is, in one sense, is right at the heart of the problem of the entire human race, this issue of coveting. This is, the, this is at, the, at the base of what's, what's the problem with all of us. For we read that Eve desired before she took. She looked at the tree that was desirable to make one wise. And the fact that it was desirable in one sense was, was not a problem. I mean, like any of the other trees, all the trees were made desirable, actually. Same word is used. But this particular tree, she didn't look at it as God told her to look at it. 
wasn't supposed to be desirable to make one wise. It was forbidden to her. But that's where it all began, coveting what was forbidden her. Dalma writes in his Ten Commandments, stated briefly, we could also say it this way, that is, this particular command, anyone who sets his desire on his neighbor's house, wife, employees, animals, will not be able to keep his hands off. With premeditation, he intends to strike. This is the primary meaning of the Tenth Commandment. And the Westminster Larger Catechism brings in several uh, attending sins or, or closely related sins in the question, answer to the question, what is forbidden in the Tenth Commandment? The sins forbidden in the Tenth Commandment are discontentment with our state, envying and grieving at the good of our neighbor together with all inordinate motions and affections to anything that is his. And that is the, the central focus of the commandment. Anything of my heart running out after that which belongs to somebody else. Whether it's out of envy, whether it's out of jealousy, whether it's out of discontentedness, whether it's being resentful that they've been blessed and I haven't, whether it's born in or attached to some sort of selfishness or pride that looks at myself higher than I ought, whatever it is, all of these sins are condemned or forbidden by the Tenth Commandment. Now, for those of you who are thinking that my treatment of this commandment is likely to be repetitive of things I've already said under the Eighth Commandment, and the seventh commandment, and the sixth commandment, let me set your minds at ease. It will be. Because God's repeated it. I'll, I'll seek to be, <laughs> not just play the tape as it were, but, uh, but at the same time I'm going to hit some, some of the same areas. Because all the commandments deal with the heart. All the commandments go beyond just the outward activity of our lives and they address the issues of the heart that lead up to those commandments. But God says, that's not enough. I want to make it plain. I want to make it plain for my people that what I'm really, what I'm concerned with, along with all of their activities, is their heart. Not only their heart, I've shown you how you're supposed to live in all your relationships and all your activities, but I'm also concerned for the heart. I am deeply concerned for the heart. And so we come to the Tenth Commandment and we go after the heart. Now Watson does something very interesting in his describing or defining what is coveting. He goes beyond that very narrow statement about putting your heart on something that belongs to somebody else and he goes broader, which, again, we've done with all the commands, right? That they're categories of sins. And he says this, it's an insatiable desire of getting the world. That's coveting. An insatiable, that is a, something that never satisfied, like a teenage boy's appetite. Never satisfied. Feed, 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 just never go. And... He quotes Augustine as saying that coveting is the desire for more than enough. And then he reminds us of the proverb uh, in Proverbs 30, 15, the leech has two daughters. Give, give. There are three things that will be satisfied for that will not say enough. And there's a sense in which that could be applied to the human heart, can't it? When coveting is in the heart, nothing is ever enough. But not only does Watson say it's an insatiable desire for the world, he says it's an inordinate love of the world. Now by world, he doesn't mean those things which are explicitly sinful, those things explicitly opposed to God. It's those things which 
come in out of this world are used up in this world and find their reward and result in this world. And so they're world bound, if you will, with no thought of anything beyond this world. One of the classic examples of somebody who had this kind of covetousness is one that I think many of us are familiar with. Well, let's turn and look at him in Luke chapter 12, verses 16 to 21, and I don't plan to expound this passage. I'll leave it for Pastor Chansky to do that. I just want to highlight some of the basic principles to understand, to underscore, coveting is not only desiring something that belongs to somebody else, it's an inordinate, unsatisfiable passion for the things of the world. Look at this man. Somebody has asked Jesus in Luke chapter 12 earlier to settle a matter with regard to uh, an inheritance, and Jesus gives a warning, and then he gives this illustration. And he says, And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a certain rich man was very productive. He began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. Nothing wrong with that, per se, is there? And there I will store all my grain and my goods. Nothing wrong with that. He's being prudent, right? And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Nothing wrong necessarily with eating, drinking, and, and enjoying the, what God has given in the, to prosper your hand, right? We saw that from Ecclesiastes chapter 8. But his whole focus here is that this is all there is, is my grain, my barns, my pleasure, my partying. And he has no thought of God. He has an inordinate love of the world, and he loves the things of this world as though God does not exist. Before we go on to read, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prospered? So is the man who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So you see this matter of coveting, and actually if you look back uh, just a couple of verses in Luke chapter 12, verse, or actually one verse, Luke 12, 15, Jesus tells us what he's actually illustrating when he says, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, and that word greed is translated in the New American Standard, greed, and every other major translation, covetousness. This is an illustration of a covetous man. So that's what it is. An insatiable love of the world, an inordinate love of the world, a setting a heart upon something which, if let go, will lead to setting one's hands upon something that is not rightfully theirs. Now, what makes covetousness so dangerous that God puts it in the Big Ten, if you will, puts it in the Ten Commandments. What makes covetousness so dangerous? Well, the first thing I want to highlight is that it's so dangerous because it is a sin which is so deep and so ingrained in all of us. It is so deep and it is so ingrained. It is deep within the soul of man. You see, God made us with desires. God is the one who made human beings to desire, to, be, to have affections, to have passions. God is the one who puts that passion in us. And again, I mentioned this in Genesis 2 and verse 9. We read that God made the fruit of the trees in the garden pleasing. That is, something which is attractive to draw out the attention and desire of Adam and Eve. They were desirable to the sight and good for food. Now, it's a good thing, isn't it, that little baby Solomon or little baby Reuben or 
Little baby Michael, any one of these new babies, isn't it a good thing that they have a desire for food? They have a passion to eat. They need to eat. They're, they're young and frail and need to be fed and need specific nutrients to strengthen them. Do you think that it's wrong for a drowning man to have a desire for air? I don't think so. He is passionate to have that air. And that's what motivates him to get to the place where he can get the air. It's life-sustaining to have that deep passion. God has put within us a desire for companionship. Even the Apostle Paul has a, had a desire for companionship. He wrote to the Philippians and said, For God is my witness. He even calls God as the witness to show, to see this is true. He says, How I long for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. I long for you. And he says to others, I long to be with you. I long to see you. I long to impart something to you. And that desire for companionship led the apostle to pray for people, led the apostle to make great travels and face great difficulties in order to get to people, to bring the gospel to people. Was that a bad passion that he had? No. The Bible goes on to talk about longing for God, longing for his word. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you. That's not a sinful passion, but it's the same basic nature. This is the way we're made. We're made with these passions, and we're made to have these passions for God himself. So that our souls long, even yearn for the courts of the Lord. Or we can say with the psalmist, I opened my mouth wide and panted, for I longed for your commandments. Now, I have to tell you something. I probably would have given up preaching on the Ten Commandments a long time ago if it weren't for you people. Because you kept asking me to preach on them. Now, that doesn't say that I, I don't want to preach on the Word of God, but you know, it's not the kind of thing I really long to get into and, and dig down in, and, but I keep having people come and say, oh, don't, don't cut that short. Don't, don't. So it's your fault. <laughs> no, I just, but I am so thrilled that you, you, the people of God here, want to see what God wants for you. And you want to see how God wants you to order your lives. And that's been a, 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 a great encouragement to my heart. That you are exemplifying these kinds of passions. These are what are in the very center of us. And God calls us not to just have desires, but have passionate desires. We are to fervently love one another. We are to be zealous for good works. We are to be like those newborn babes and long, not for milk, but for the milk of the word. And more than that, we are to be willing to get into the gymnasium of exercising our minds and our souls in order to understand the meat of the word. So it's a dangerous sin, you see, because it, it's attached to something so deep and so ingrained in us. This is where these passions are. Remember when, G, when God described what the, the world was like after or before the flood. Even the, the intents of the thoughts of the hearts were only wicked, always. Deep down inside, these passions and desires. And God's coming right down at the beginnings, as it were, at the roots as he comes into each of our hearts with this commandment and says, do not covet. Do not have an insatiable love for the world, an insatiable desire for the world. Do not have an inordinate love for the world. That's one of the reasons why it's so dangerous. 
It's one of the reasons why we ought to thank God that we have this commandment before us and that we have the word of God that expounds this for us, that we might be able to root that out of our hearts. That even in the depths of our hearts, we would be pleasing to God. But secondly, the dangerous command or dangerous sin, covetousness, because it's so expansive. And here, uh, I, all kinds of words. Extensive, widespread, varied, multicolored. You see, if it's right there at the root of our desires, and it's there that this sin is born, which of these desires does our deceptive heart twist and pervert from good desires to sinful, covetous desires. Which ones? Well, let's look at Exodus chapter 20 here. Or you could turn to Deuteronomy 5. They say basically the same thing, slightly different words. We have here in, these, in this command a great, be- great deal of detail about what we're not to covet. But we should not think of that detail as being exhaustive because he doesn't mind changing the order when he restates it in Deuteronomy chapter 5. These are categories. And so you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So what are some of the different things then that we desire in life that God, that sin, that our sin of our hearts can pervert those good desires into sinful things? How about a wife? You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Now, a wife is a good thing, right? He who has obtains a wife has, a, has obtained favor from the Lord. So that passion, that desire that God gives for one woman to be that woman in your life, for one man to be that special man in your life, that desire that God gives you, which is a good desire, or generally speaking, a good desire, it's not good for the man to be alone, sin comes along and perverts that. And we think immediately of the seventh commandment, do we not? You shall not commit adultery. Sin comes along and says, you know, I'm not satisfied with the one that I have. So I want to go outside the marriage to satisfy these desires. And sin lays lays on that, looks at somebody else, says, you know what? That woman, that man is more attractive than my wife or my husband. And so the desire then turns into ideas and fantasizing and reaches out, as it were, at least with the mind, if not with the hand. We can covet a wife. But you see, not always does it have to be in line with the seventh commandment. Because coveting somebody's wife could go along these lines. I don't want necessarily that wife, but I sure wish my wife could cook like she could. Sure wish my husband had a, had a sense of being able to lead as that man does. I wish my husband knew how to write poetry like that man does. And then the inordinate desire starts to grow in the dissatisfaction with one's own wife and and the dissatisfaction with what God has given to you. And so we can covet somebody else's wife, somebody else's husband, or house. This is, again, a pretty obvious one, right? This is, this is what we generally think of when we think of coveting, don't we? Possessions. Possessions. We, we think of coveting what somebody else has. And certainly that's one of the things that we can covet. We can covet their very house, the abode in which they live. Well, their house is bigger. I, you know, I don't think, here's, here's where I, I, I think that he's talking about something other than just the actual act of stealing. 
There aren't too many people that go around stealing houses. You don't get away with that too readily. Now, maybe in that, agri- ag- that culture, there was a way to you know, drive the people out of the house. Maybe that's what he's thinking. But you know, there, there's something more here, you see? He's after the heart. Not necessarily the actions that follow, but the heart itself. Has the heart itself set itself upon something that it ought not to be set upon? Whether it's the size or the location. I become discontent with what I have. I become envious of what they have. I ought to have something like that. We both graduated from the same school. We both have gone through the same training. How come he got the good job with the big paycheck and I'm scrounging around to try to find work? Or fields. Deuteronomy includes the word field. Your neighbor's field. I haven't coveted anybody's field, so I can skip that one. But what was the field, right? The means by which he provided for his family. And some fields uh, produce more. If you've got a a farm in in Iowa where where the dirt is black versus a farm in Colorado where the dirt is light brown because it's sand... Guess which is going to produce more per acre? You got it, Iowa. But Colorado's still better. But the fact of the matter is that there is this sense in which, you know, I could covet somebody else's field. I could covet your job because you work half as much time as I do and make twice the pay that I do. And that's not fair. I ought to have that. I'm the one with the intelligence. I'm the one with the the abilities. Or we can actually begin to covet not just the field they work in, but the abilities they have to do that field. I'm jealous that they got a better education than I did. I'm jealous that they've got gifts and strengths that I don't have. I'm jealous and envious of how they can use their hands or use their mind or whatever it might be. Now, is it wrong to have a desire for a better paying job, that you might have more to give to the Lord, that you might have more to give to those who have need, that you might be able to meet your bills a little more readily. No, it's not wrong to have that. But an inordinate passion that this is what I'm living for that leads to working overtime constantly to the neglect of your family, to the neglect of your own soul. Or that craving inside, says, I've just got to have it, I've got to have it, I'm totally dissatisfied. My first job out of college, I was working in the payroll department. And I was, I was, for the most part, going, wow, I can't believe they paid me to do this. For four years, I've been grinding away computer programming, and, and now they're actually giving me money to do this. This is fun. But you know what you do in payroll department? You process everybody else's paycheck. And guess whose paychecks look bigger than yours most of the time? And the temptation is there to, well, it's not. I, they just hired him a week ago. I've been here for a year and a half. And he's making twice what I made. Now, I'm not going to steal their salary. But there's still that coveting in my heart that says, I ought to have that. And that stinks, if I can put it this way, to high heaven. God smells it, and it is stinky to him. Or male and female servants. I guess if we knew somebody that had servants, we we might be tempted to covet that. Uh, We might be tempted to have their servants. But we do have servants, don't we? Modern day servants. Power tools. Yeah. Right? I got a table saw. I got a chainsaw. Oh, wow, you know, I, 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 I can easily covet people's tools, their computer. Wow, he's got 16 gig. Wow, he's got the, the new tablet. Forget the iPad. He's got all kinds of, look at this. This is incredible, and I can covet. I, I'm not going to steal it, but my heart's desire says, wow, I'm not satisfied with what I have anymore. 
Now mine runs incredibly slow, though 30 seconds ago it was the fastest thing on the face of the earth. Or kitchen appliances. There's some modern day maids. Do all our dishes for us. Stack them up, close the door, come back and they're done. Coffee makers. We don't have to do like they used to do. Grind, 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 put it in the percolator, put it on the stove, try to get the stove. We don't have to go out and get the wood and shove it in there. We just click, 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 goes on, turn it on, heat's on. It was just servants. And we can covet other people's servants, can't we? That new kitchen that somebody got. And now mine is old and decrepit. And all the little problems that I just was used to putting up with now are a problem. Or having the mess cell phone. Right? Two new, uh, two, new every two, right? Why do we have to get a new cell phone every two years? Is it really necessary? Well, no, but there's a new one out. And it does this and that, and it's got more of this, and th I gotta have a new one. They've got the new one. Covet, covet. Or the ox or the donkey. This would have been the equivalent in, in, in an agricultural environment of the tractor. Now, I haven't coveted anybody's tractor. But I might their car, or their minivan, that, or their truck, or their you name it. But then, just so you know that this is really just generic, what's the last phrase of the command? Or anything that belongs to your neighbor. All right, in case I missed you, anything else you like in life? Any other circumstance or capability or ability or quality or thing that somebody has that you think you ought to have and are discontent because you don't? Now you see, it's the New Testament, when it takes up this commandment, immediately, or for the most part, deals with this on a very broad basis. It doesn't deal with the very narrow coveting what your neighbor has within the community, but it's just coveting in general. And as far as I can tell, every place in the New Testament where the Tenth Commandment is quoted, it's quoted only with this small phrase, you shall not covet. Romans 7 and verse 7, Romans 13 and verse 9, And it, and it speaks of it in very broad terms. Look with me at, at, at Romans 7 for a minute. Romans chapter 7. And this is instructive again, just to see how broad this command really is of coveting. Now this is Paul giving his personal testimony of how God converted him. Of how God brought him to see his sinfulness and how God brought him to see his need of Jesus Christ. And he used the law. We read in chapter 7 and verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary. I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. In verse 8 we read, But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting. And notice what he says after that. Of every kind. Of all varieties, for apart from the law, sin is dead. Not just one narrow little thing called coveting, but coveting in all kinds of forms. Now, remember that Paul's a religious man. Paul's a highly religious man. Paul's life was one that was well-ordered according to the word of God. Paul could say, basically, probably, of the first nine commandments, like the rich young ruler, I have kept them all since my youth. But when God opened his eyes and brought the bright light of the tenth commandment and shone it down into the depths of his heart, Paul said, you know what I'm motivated by? 
I'm motivated by coveting. I covet. Maybe it was the position of somebody else. Maybe it was the things that somebody else would have. Maybe, it was, maybe in his Phariseeism, sometimes he actually thought, wouldn't it be great to be free from this? I covet those who never had such a training, that I might be able to be free and run off into sin. Maybe that's what he was coveting. But it says coveting of every kind. Jesus, when he's talking about coveting, he says, beware and be on your guard against every form of, of covetousness. Every form. And in that context, there's two pictures of things. The first is the man who's fighting tenaciously, he's consumed with fighting for his inheritance. Now think about this for a minute, because I'm going to come back to this. I, I'm not going to touch on this. I'm just going to touch on it right now. This person is standing before God incarnate, who's done incredible miracles, who came into this world to save sinners, who has spoken amazing things to people. And this man is, sees Jesus, and what does he ask? Jesus, sort out my inheritance for me. You have the prospect of being right with God from the one who can say, your sins are forgiven. You have the prospect of being made right with God and having the hope of heaven because Jesus himself is standing right there and you are concerned about your inheritance? You're concerned about a few shekels? Do you see how how imbalanced this person's question is? We'll come back to that when we deal with the answer to covetousness. He misses, as it were, the one thing needful. Because he's focused on having his money. And he goes on to talk about the man who has it all in terms of finances. And yet he too is a covetous man. Covetousness has no bounds. It has no economic bounds, brethren. Covetousness is not something that just comes to the poor who would like to have more. It comes to the richest. Because like Augustine said, it's a desire to have more than enough. And in fact, for many a wealthy person, there's never enough. There always must be more. There's got to be the new car. There's got to be the bigger house. There's got, and it just goes on and on. Covetousness has no economic bounds. Covetousness has no ethnic bounds. Covetousness has no gender bounds. Covetousness has no age bounds. Covetousness is extensive to anything that you could possibly want in this world. That's why this is a dangerous sin. It's so deeply ingrained in us, and it is so extensively set before us. Why do you think there are so many advertising companies? Why do you think ads for the Super Bowl cost so much money, and people are willing to pay it? Because we are a covetous people. And they're trying to get the hook in you where your longings most lie. But as well, I must hasten on, it's dangerous because thirdly, it is subtle and crafty. We have a new heart in Christ. We are no longer under the dominion of sin. The very heart of our passions, the deepest center of us is different. And yet at the same time, though it's not doesn't have the same level, the, the sin does not have the same level of power over us. The dominion has been broken, the guilt has been dealt with, yet it's of the same nature. Our heart is still deceitful. It still lies to us. It's still crafty. And it takes things that are bad and tries to make them look good. 
And so where there really is this selfishness and grabbing and holding to oneself, we speak of frugality. Now, I didn't plan that this was going to happen on this Lord's Day just after we heard about giving this morning and the need for the Trinity Christian School. And I'm not trying to say that if you don't give to the Trinity Christian School, therefore you're covetous. But brethren, isn't it just often the case that we take our covetous passions to keep things to ourselves and call it being frugal and being wise when in fact we're just being selfish. And that's what we need to pray about. And that's why we give a week's time to deal with this so that we can search our hearts. So that we can cry to God to search our hearts and see if there be any wicked way in us that he might move us to do that which is pleasing to him. And we might do it in a way that is pleasing to him. You know, one of the greatest lies that our hearts use for us, our hearts lie to us and tell us that wants are needs. And it deceives us. Oh, I, I, I want that new thing, whatever it might be. Oh, now I need that new thing, whatever it might be. When in fact, we were doing fine without it before we saw it. You know, having been to some poor countries, you see people living in the worst of circumstances with absolutely nothing but dirt floors and a burner, one bare light bulb, and they are happy, and they are I mean, there's people all over the place, but they are happy and they're living contentedly until they get a TV that gets a television station from America. And they go, wow, that's how people live? And suddenly it's not pleasant anymore. And the covetousness in their heart gets all stirred up. And they got to have. And they got to have. It's subtle and it's crafty filling our minds with thoughts of the world so that our mouths are filled with a thought with words about the world and all we can talk about is the world makes the heart interested in things of the world so that we miss heaven when Jesus tells us plainly what will it profit a man if he gained the whole world and yet lose his very soul what do you think of the man who's sitting off of the Titanic, Titanic, and he's got two gold bags, one in each hand, and they come by with a raft, and they say, drop the bags, get into the raft. And he says, i got to have my bags. You say, you're an idiot. You'll have your gold, and you'll go to the bottom. You'll have your gold, or you'll have your passion for gold, because you won't ever have the amount that you really think you ought to, probably. You'll have your passion for gold and you won't relinquish it and confess it before Christ and it will take you not just to the bottom of the ocean, it will take you to hell. Because you've been deceived by your heart into thinking that this gold is really what's most important. And it is so subtle and it is so crafty that it'll take the very thing that you need most to set you free and it'll hide it from you. Just like, that rich, just like that man who wanted his inheritance and missed the opportunity to ask Jesus to save him from his sins. Even so, we read in Jesus' own words about those who hear the preaching of God's word and it does no good to them because of the covetousness of their hearts. Mark 4, verses 18 and 19. And others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word and the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And so you hear from the word of God, thou shalt not covet. Coveting comes along and chokes it. And says, that doesn't apply to me. These are things I have to have. It's a dangerous sin because it's so much, so deep and it's so extensive and it's so crafty. But, but fourthly, it's so dangerous because it fuels other 
sins. It fuels others' sins. Well, I'm not going to go into that. I'm not going to take too long. Because there's a whole host of other sins that, that covetousness gives birth to. It seldom sits by itself. Well, I shouldn't say that. Probably in most of you, most of us, who are good religious people, covetous, covetousness sits there and never breaks out in a lot of other sins. We never steal. We never, we never commit adultery. We ne- but it's still there. So my friends, I'd say tonight I come back to Solomon's words. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. This is no small sin. This is the heart of the matter. This is the heart of the matter. And is your heart right with God? Can your heart stand the scrutiny of God? Oh, you may be an upright person. You may be a kind person. You may have done all kinds of good things in your life. But God looks down into the heart and he says, are you living for things? Are you living for something other than me? And Jesus then puts his words on top of Solomon's words to watch. And he says, beware. Beware. Be on your guard against every form of covetousness. Well, you say, well, I've never thought that I wanted that from my brother. I've never coveted anybody's car. I've never coveted anybody's... Well, wait a minute. I guess there was that one... Time, or is that one area? Every kind of greed. Every kind of covetousness. Where are you dissatisfied with the lot that God has given to you? Where are you envious of others because of what they are or what they have or what their position is, or what their circumstances are. Where is that area in your life that that desire, the sinful deceitfulness of your heart, the deceitfulness of sin, is speaking to you and saying, I ought to have that. And I'm dissatisfied with what God has given me. You see, that's basically unbelief, isn't it? Is God not all wise? Has he not distributed all of his gifts appropriately? Has he not given to those, each one, what they need? Beware, brethren, beware. Be on your guard against every form of covetousness. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Even if you got what your desire, heart's desire, it wouldn't be enough for your life. You might still lose your very soul. And so we need to stop loving the world. And the things of the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Some interesting ways to describe covetousness, if you will. All of these things are not from the Father, but above the world. Maybe you covet being the firstborn. Maybe you covet getting the privileges that your brother or sister have. Maybe you covet getting the opportunities that your brother or sister that God has given to them. Maybe that's where you're coveting. Wherever it might be. Take it to Christ. Take it to Christ, for he alone can set us free, as we heard this morning in the adult class. You see, it's looking full in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ that the things of this world grow strangely dim. It's looking fully upon Christ and saying, you alone, Christ, can wash me clean from this sin. You alone, Jesus, can give me the grace to overcome this sin. For my heart is mine. And I love it. And what it wants, I want. Deliver me from this. Give me grace to overcome this. Help me that I might live a life pleasing to you, even in the depths of my heart. May God help us. Let's pray.
Father, be merciful to us to deliver us from all unrighteousness. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us all of the sins of the heart, some of which nobody else knows. But Lord, there's enough there to condemn us before you for all eternity. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Grant unto us that we might find forgiveness in him. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.